I would encourage people in the hallway to come on in because we're going to get started. So thank you everyone for, for coming to Chaos Town again and coming back this afternoon after, after lunch. We're going to keep you awake with more awesome talks. So we're kicking off the afternoon with a um, note from Jeff. With that, I will turn it over to him. Does this work? Test, test. It is. There we go. Can you hear me well? Yes. Yeah. Perfect. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. My name is Jana Gallus. I'm an, an assistant professor in strategy and in behavioral decision making at UCLA's business school, UCLA Anderson. Um, in my research, I focus really um, on motivation and incentives in the knowledge economy and trying to find out what works to motivate people and sustain people's motivations. Mostly, as you'll see, using field experiments to disentangle cause from effect and to say what is just a correlation and what is an actual causation of different policies we may be thinking about. Today I'll be talking about what could be called two of the thorniest challenges in community management. The first one is diversity and inclusion, and Zahida mentioned that in her talk also this morning, earlier this morning. These are just some illustrative figures from open source, but also from Wikipedia, showing that less than 10% identify as male. And I just picked gender here as one example. The comparison to Wikipedia is interesting because Wikipedia is not just about code. In fact, even the different topics you may be working on are not male type. The readership is gender balanced, and yet you observe this stark pattern of a predominantly male self-identified group of editors. Um, so that's one, the first challenge I'll be talking about today and asking what community management practices can we use and what, we, what do we actually know about their causal effects? Do they move the needle in furthering participation and more equal participation, but also, importantly, inclusion, because this, these figures only show who's in the room. They don't yet talk about who's actually talking up while being in the room, and it turns out there is another barrier here, and I have some, a, a new paper where we look at Wikipedia talk page discussions, and we actually find that when you look at the edit level, an even lower percentage of edits come from, from females. So this is then an issue of inclusion. I'll be talking about that. The second challenge I'll be addressing in today's keynote is um, how to support people's motivations. And in particular, that's another topic that actually Zahida also mentioned in today's, this morning's talk, is retention. How do you retain talent? And I'll be talking about different experiments, one particularly about that I ran with the community of Wikipedians, because they face, as you can see in this graph, that's one of the most well-known graphs on this, which is the, the number of active um, editors in the community, and you can see it's been declining since about 2007. So then the question is, in these contexts, which tools do we have, which policies can we implement in order to sustain people's motivation and keep them at bay and keep them actively involved in your community? Now, why this is interesting, and also for me from a research perspective, why this is particularly interesting is because in these contexts of open communities, we don't really oftentimes have the incentives that we know quite a bit about, which is mostly monetary incentives. Why? Well, on the one hand, of course, there is a budget constraint. It would be unthinkable and sheer cost prohibitive to pay everybody who's contributing to your project, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes. Even if you are able, for some reason you have the funds, in Wikipedia's case that would be unthinkable, but even if you are able to pay so that budget constraint is not as binding in your case, there are still two remaining problems, which is one, many of the tasks that your projects need are complex. It goes way beyond lines of code, as we all know. And so, a problem when important tasks such as pro-social behavior cannot be measured or measured accurately or as well cannot be measured as well as other dimensions is that as soon as you start introducing high-powered incentives that are based on these measurable dimensions, effort provision on the less measurable dimensions is being jeopardized. So you end up in a world of multitasking, we call it multitasking, where people just focus on whatever is being incentivized. So effectively, you get what you pay for. It's just that you don't really pay for what you really need because you can't always 
um, incentivize and measure that and then tie the, the appropriate incentives to that. Now, taking this one step, level, one level further up, even if you were able to measure everything appropriately and even measure pro-social tasks that are oftentimes not even perhaps visible online, right? Mentorship activities, for example, are just one example. Um, even if you're able to track those and measure those, starting to tie incentives to those other dimensions risks resulting in what we call motivation crowding out. And by that, I mean, on the one hand, intrinsic motivation crowding out, so people who used to do a, div a given task, let's say used to play the violin because they really enjoyed it, once you start giving incentives and tying incentives to each and every piece they play, they start, may start losing interest in the actual underlying task and just, you know, their motivation shifts from an intrinsic motivation to an extrinsic motivation. And as soon as you discontinue the incentives, you'll no longer see effort provision coming forth. Another form of motivation motivation that risks being undermined, in particular in contexts such as open source or other pro-social activities, I mean, where pro-social activities are even more um, crucial here, pro-social motivations, is of course image motivation crowding out as well. People see that you are getting paid for whatever you do now. It's no longer clear why you actually engage in that activity. Maybe you just wanted to volunteer and also, you know, benefit from that positive image among the community, but now you're getting paid, and so it's no longer really clear why you're doing that. Note that I don't say we should not use monetary incentives. I'm just pointing out, not at all, I'm just pointing out their limitations and why in community, in open community management, these monetary incentives are difficult to use for those reasons that I just highlighted. Now that, of course, then begs the question of which alternatives we have. And it turns out there's one of the most prevalent forms of non-monetary incentives has received very little attention so far, in particular in the research community and academia, because it's very difficult to disentangle exactly cause and effect, and maybe because we've just focused a lot on these so-called economic incentives in the past. What am I talking about? I'm talking about recognition, and this is actually what I've been focusing on um, in, yeah, I think that is the major focus of my research, which is recognition in the forms of awards. You can see I just picked some examples. You all know awards are everywhere. These examples illustrate that's not just a phenomenon in the US, <laughs> where it's very, they are, they are ubiquitous also in other countries, and actually even historically awards have always been used. Think of the Légion d'honneur in France and many other uh, countries. You also see they take different forms. We don't quite understand what matters, which different dimensions are most important, should they be very public or is it okay to deliver recognition in a more private form? Those are all questions that we really need to address because they have important implications. And here I also of course um, highlight two examples, just two from the online community, the Mozilla Open Badges project as well as the CII uh, Best Practices Badges. So you can see this recognition and awards can be given to individuals but also to projects and whole organizations, right? And the question now is, what effect does this actually have? Do we just see the best and the most motivating getting the awards and getting the recognition, and then they just stay the most active, the most motivated, so the award had no effect? In fact, the award could have even backfired and reduced their motivation, and they might still outperform the rest, right? So this could just be that the best get awards and they just stay the best. We don't know whether the recognition overall had an actual causal impact on their subsequent behavior or whether it had even an impact on others who did not yet receive recognition. And that's what I'll be talking about today as an example, but this really also stands for how you can think about other community management practices and really try to address and empirically analyze their causal effects. So that's now, I'm building on the data, on the talk about data this morning, and then, and um, Zahida mentioned correlations, and then trying to think about how can we get beyond correlations and think about actual causal effects to try to figure out with the data that we have what works and what actually might have deleterious effects. 
Um, so these are just some examples of organizations I'm working with and have been working with. I'll be talking about the Wikipedia field experiment today. There's another current project, a field experiment with NASA that I'm working on um, with co-authors at Harvard, um, GitLab, then also in the public sector with schools, a recent publication with co-authors at Harvard. I'll actually be talking about this today. Um, traditional firms, you know, offline firms um, are also, of course, very interested in recognition schemes because they are, well, also quite cheap and in fact sometimes even costless to implement and then other platform-based business models. This here, Top Coder, is just one example of the collaborations I've been engaged with. with. I'll be talking about some of them today. So let's first talk about this challenge of supporting people's motivations. Here I, I'm talking about that Wikipedia field experiment that I just mentioned. Wikipedia has a really important problem with newcomer retention, as many, of course, communities do, for various intriguing reasons that I w I'm happy to talk about offline, but not in this talk today. And then um, the question then is, what can, what, which tools do we have to support people's motivations, and in particular, to keep newcomers engaged and active? And so so in order to address that question, I reached out to the community of Wikipedians and then worked with several really fantastic people from the community, from the, in particular the Swiss community of Wikipedians, on establishing, establishing an award scheme, which is actually at a national level almost, and um, figuring out what the causal effects are of such a newcomer award on subsequent motivation and behavior. So this is the award um, template that we then posted on the newcomers' talk pages. For those of you who know Wikipedia, I'm sure all of you have somehow contributed to Wikipedia at some point. Um, this is the, the, the individual user's profile page, and each user has sort of like the flip side where people can address them, and this is where I posted that Edelweiss Award for newcomers. And we also have an award board an award page that accompanies these individual templates that each user gets and that just outlines the idea and the importance of the award. Also it contains the names of the reputable community members behind the award scheme because of course with recognition it's important. Sociologists will tell you you need a source of esteem, of prestige, of status in order to confer status, right? And so that's why also one other reason why this collaboration with the community was at the heart of this problem, of this project and in fact also in many other regards was really a fundamental keystone of that um, experiment. Now, in order to address cause and effect, what did I do? Each month I would um, scrape the list of the previous month's newcomers and apply some rigorous um, rules that we had developed together in order to filter out vandals, for example, but otherwise keeping the barrier quite low because we're talking about newcomers, right? So we didn't want to apply any criteria al along the lines of the person should have made 100 edits because it's not even clear that quantity here is what you want, right? So it's also quality you're looking for. And since those are newcomers, we could keep the barriers relatively low and don't apply too many criteria. And from that final pool of newcomers each month, and this is now the core to experimentation, each month I would randomly allocate 150 into the treatment group, which would receive the award, and the remaining 150 roughly each month into the control group. So there's no way in which those two groups differ other than one group ran by chance, happened to receive the award and the other didn't. So that's like the gold standard in terms of identifying cause and effect, identifying causality in the sciences in order to, to really tell what works. So here again, it's the randomization that's at the core. And then afterwards, the analysis act is actually fairly straightforward. So what we can do, and I'm just showing the major takeaways now in today's talk, there's a whole paper behind, which is actually available open access so you can just freely downloaded. Um, what I'm showing here is just a comparison. See, look at the retention rates in the treatment group and the control group that just, they are not different in any way, just the treatment group happened to get this newcomer award. And I'm talking about more than 4,000 subjects or individuals who were part of this experiment in order to be statistically powered enough to detect effects. So what you see here is that this purely symbolic award, which was given to people under their pseudonyms, so there's no career implications from this award. There's no offline implications from this award. Some people <laughs> like to say, some academics like to say there are no real world implications from this award. Well, but that's not true, right? Because people care tremendously about even pseudonyms 
pseudonyms in this online community. And you see, although there are no career implications, this award increased the retention rate in the subsequent month by 20%. And that effect is not only substantively significant, but also statistically highly significant. So you can see that there, it has a p-value of 0 0.000. And um, then there are, of course, many other analyses that I did in this paper to look at you know, how it impacted different forms of contributions, for example, tedious maintenance tasks. So did this award also increase the rate of newcomers who would engage in these tedious tasks, you know, cleaning up behind others? Yes, it did. What about, this is just the, the subsequent month, what about the following year? Well, because the revision processes in academic journals take a while, <laughs> I had the benefit that I was able to then also look at the long-term treatment effect persistence. And here, just looking very simply at the quarters, at the five quarters, four quarters following the initial award bestowal, you can see that, again, the retention rate in the treatment group, which is the first column or in the treatment column, and the control group significantly differed, and that treatment effect continued to be statistically significant, actually, for the four quarters following the initial award bestowal. And then it just um, wasn't statistically significant anymore, but you still see it points into the expected direction where the treatment group has a higher retention rate compared to the control group. And I'm not saying this is only because of the award, because one other fact of recognition, and which is actually something communities can leverage, is that they also create external, well, they create effects on non-winners, right? Non-winners who see the award, who might go on to congratulate the award recipients, which kind of revives that positive feeling from having been acknowledged um, by some senior community members. And then there's, of course, another issue that I'm intrigued to study um, which I don't address in this paper, which is around the question of whether such recognition, public recognition, can actually be used in order to create role models, which is unthinkable using monetary incentives, right? Here's somebody who got this bonus and then establishing them as a financial role model. With awards, that's actually the very purpose of awards, right? These external effects on third parties as well. So the implications from this first study, the, the major takeaways of what I've shown you now is that, yes, purely symbolic awards by that I mean they don't have any career material or career related implications can be used to sustainably motivate uh, contributors, new, con new contributors in this case, who don't even yet identify with that online community as much. They've just started, had their first edit to an article the pre in the previous month. And then I also find significant positive effects on doing tedious maintenance tasks, which is of course really valuable for any community. And then they also, if I look at what are the mechanisms, what are possible reasons why I observe that positive effect, there are two that I want to point out here, which is on the one hand confidence. The award seems to have increased these newcomers' confidence to make valuable contributions. And this is just one excerpt from an award recipient who posted that on a public, one of the public pages on Wikipedia. Others would go on and thank their mentors for their great mentorship. So you see the positive spillovers. They are also in a qualitative sense here. And the other reason why awards can have positive effects is because they foster identification with the community. You've been sort of labeled as a, commu as a valuable community member, the Edelweiss Award recipient, and um, part of, as, as a Wikipedian, right? And so that creates this sense of identity, which can be an important force um, well, linking individuals to projects and to organizations more broadly. That's why many firms, of course, also try to use awards, although they come at the risk of your talent being poached away by competitors, of course. Um, second, let me talk, take a break and talk about the diversity and inclusion um, challenge that I was referring to earlier. Thank you. Um, here, this is now um, drawing just to show you the, the different range, the different types of experiments we can also run in order to, to inform our practical problems that we're facing in the field. This will draw on lab experimental data, but the problem is a very, is one in, you know, that you observe in practice, which is that oftentimes teams miss out on high quality contributions from some of their smartest members. And that is even though those smartest members are sitting around the table and are among the co-founders, are sitting on the board, are in your seminar room or in your corporate board meeting, and um, yet they don't speak up. 
And so there, there's a literature on knowledge transfer that has focused largely on, you know, motivational reasons. People may not want to share their knowledge. They may want to privately benefit from their knowledge. Here in this paper, we are actually addressing a different mechanism or psychological channel, if you want to call it such, uh, which is self-stereotyping. And that is rooted in beliefs, in people's beliefs. That's why it's important to take it to the lab, because you can oftentimes not observe those beliefs. So this is not a story about motivation motivation and people wanting to benefit from their knowledge privately. This is also not about lacking the knowledge because though we actually observe people's ability and we see the high ability types don't speak up. This is also not about social discrimination being discriminated by others, although I'll say that may come on top of course. It's also not about a general underconfidence but rather here in this case it is about not speaking up because you don't fit the stereotype of that field or of that task. Specifically, what I'm talking about is women working in STEM fields, for example, who don't fit the stereotype of that field. You can think of code, of course, as well. <laughs> and uh, sadly, I'm laughing, but it's, of course, um, not it's a serious issue. So um, what we then do is we, we try, we first document, and that has actually been shown by great research previously, the self-stereotyping problem relating to other um, tasks. And um, we then ask this question about which policies we can use in order to correct people's beliefs and make high ability types, as we call them, because it's a lab experiment, high ability individuals more confident to speak up. And so, again, focusing on recognition, we experimentally vary whether that recognition is just in the form of private feedback, only the individual sees it, only the best performer sees it. Is it virtual, which is of course inspired by the Wikipedia project and by so many online collaborations where much of the collaboration takes place in virtual rooms and you might not even see the others face to face. And then the third arm would be public, introducing face to face contact in the form of a ceremony. So basically trying to understand whether there's some face value to in, you know, incurring a somewhat higher costs but staging a ceremony where people get a bit more exposure and their faces will be seen and they'll see the non-recipients in the audience. And this is focusing on collaborative tasks where the teams have an incentive to have the highest performer speak up and push their idea forward in order for the team to benefit from that idea. Um, it's computer mediated, as I said, and it took place in a lab. So that's a caveat I want to put out here. And so what we measure is people's willingness or confidence to speak up. That's what I'll show you here as the dependent variable. On the next graph here, you see that comparing the um, confidence to speak up before the award bestowal and after the award bestowal and comparing those two, the blue group of non-recipients with the recipients, you see that the award, in fact, the recognition, uh, all forms of recognition substantially increased um, the, no, the recipient's confidence to speak up. And that is also if we control for ability and the regressions, which I won't show here, just to focus on the main findings. And now, of course, this major question, does the form of recognition matter in particular if our interest is closing the gender gap in speaking up. Here I show you the different um, treatments before the, the, the um, th six columns on the left is before the treatment, pre-treatment, and then after the treatment, you see that we actually, in the ceremony, we close the gender ga gap in speaking up. So male, males and females have at least statistically sig um, indistinguishable speak up con confidence to speak up. And that is just in the ceremony treatment. The others increase the confidence to speak up, but they do nothing in terms of closing the gender gap. So there seems to be a value to putting the face out and staging a ceremony. And um, what now in a nutshell this experiment shows us is that on the one hand of course just to make people aware that there are self-stereotyping issues that can in fact prevent teams from hearing some of the best ideas, that recognition increases the confidence to contribute overall, but that in, fa in fact for the gender gap this, the form of recognition matters and that's now one of the new avenues of research on awards also, which is no longer to document what the effects of awards are writ large, but to find out how, do, how can we design recognition schemes so that they are the most effective in addressing the problem that we want to address with them, right? And so in this case, the public ceremony, it's, there is value
value to staging a public ceremony. And why is that? Well, we have some exploratory, and I flag that exploratory research, where we look at why, why we find that differential gender effect and the closing of the gender gap in the public treatment. And it seems that, um, on the one hand, being seen by the audience as a high ability type increases women's confidence to speak up in this gender atypical domain, but also seeing the audience increases trust in the signal, so it's not like something that they gave everybody, but actually I can see that I'm among the few who got the award and there's the, the other audience of non-recipients. So it's also a, trust, a matter of trust in this signal. Now, I've talked about the benefits of recognition. I want to end with pointing out their limitations as well, which I will also use as a plea for empirical investigations trying to set up, in particular, experiments to really see what, whether your incentive scheme has the intended effects. So this now will be is a project where we, with collaborators at Harvard and Stanford, which has recently been published, um, and the, quote, the, the reference is underneath at the bottom, where we test two of the most prevalent types of awards, which is, and in both cases they are based on attendance, which is on the one hand, what happens if you promise an award ex ante, which is the prospective award? Can you incentivize people to do what you want them to do? In this case, be present and don't have as many absences, ideally have perfect uh, presence, a perfect attendance, or as opposed to this promised and explicit incentive, what happens if you recognize them ex post? There's some psychological research from the 70s suggesting that, you know, this ex post surprise recognition is the most effective. So we tested this. We put this out in a large scale field experiment in the US um, with more than 15,000 participants to see what the effects are. We used a context where these awards are <laughs> as ubiquitous as you could think think, which is schools and in the US, and tested whether they have the intended effects. Now, let me show you. We see, in fact, great, a significant effect in one of the treatment groups, which is this promising retrospective surprise award group. It's statistically significant positive effect compared to the control group and also actually compared to the other um, award group. Now, the problem here is that what I'm showing you as the dependent variable or on the y-axis is actually absences. So this award has increased the number of absences and the fraction of students who are, um, who, who, well, it has increased the number of absences by 8% by in the subsequent month. And that's, of course, a huge issue. So here you see it's not just that the recognition was ineffective that's been used and that is being used so broadly. It's actually that it had opposite effects from what you wanted it to do. We, in the paper, we, of course, also address, now you may wonder why, we address the reasons. I won't talk about them too much to create some curiosity curiosity and um, motivate you to look at the paper. But this is what the, the basic message I want to get across here is that even though there's this intuitive appeal that recognition is, is great because it's oftentimes cost free, it can only motivate people. Well, that's actually not true. It can also backfire. And here we've shown this in a rigorous field experiment. Some of the reasons why recognition can backfire, and that's something to keep in mind also if you, we've had a conversation earlier about rankings, and you may think about ranking individuals or ranking or entire groups or organizations. So on the one hand, if it's at the individual level, you risk crowding out people's motivation. At the end of the day, it is an extrinsic mo incentive. Second, you can, just as uh, similar to monetary incentives, you can actually induce strategic gaming and multitasking if this becomes high stakes and you, you clearly show these are the criteria you have to fulfill, you risk that people do exactly that and just forget about all the rest that you don't include. You can also induce hubris, of course, and for those who don't receive the recognition, there can be envy and the, the resulting negative behaviors as a consequence. So it's really important to think in advance, think clearly about how you design your recognition scheme in order, in order for it to have positive effects. Um, it's also important not to forget, and those are, I think, two of the main takeaways, not to forget tasks that are less visible, visible or not yet measurable. 
um, are not as easy to measure compared to lines of code. Uh, just one example, lines of code, you probably all know the infamous IBM example where they started compensating coders based on the lines of code with, of course, the, the obvious consequences now in hindsight. So think about the tasks that are less vis visible and also think about, and there's some great research done, done by colleagues of mine at UCLA also, um, about people who have uh, not, who have made an effort in the past and you, you may want to recognize as you roll out a recognition scheme. Main takeaways, recognition can be used even if it's purely symbolic to sustainably motivate contributors. It can um, also make atypical um, users more confident to contribute and therewith address this issue of diversity and inclusion. But there is no one-size-fits-all recognition scheme and so you really have to take into account your specific project's needs and also the people, the selection of people into your project who contribute to your project and you have to be aware of possible unintended effects and set up the stage when you run an experiment so that you are able to measure those effects. So this is a plea to institutionalize recognition, design it wisely and importantly test. So by using these experiments that I've been talking about and one major reason why I'm particularly excited to talk to you here today is that um, I'm sure that some of you will think about recognition schemes and other community practices going forward and if you're interested in testing them and designing an experiment around them then please do reach out um, and uh, let's talk about it also offline um, for the rest of the day. Thanks.